here. Yes, we're gathering today here on what day is it? Saturday, October 10th. It is quarter after 12. I'm so happy that we have everybody here. Whoop, whoop. Can I get a round of applause for the final day of PXR 2020? Yeah, I love me those hand emojis. Perfect. All right. Welcome to our product ownership workshop. First, I'd like to say but that PXR 2020 is brought to you by Single Thread Theater Company and Electric Company Theater. And thanks to our community partners, Toaster Lab and Langara Center for the Entertainment Arts. And with the funding support of the Canada Council for the Arts' Digital Strategies Fund. I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today live from the stolen territories of the Coast Salish people here in Vancouver, BC. They are the homes of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And I would like to acknowledge, especially on a day such as the Thanksgiving weekend, that I am very privileged to be where I am with the technology that I have to be gathered with you all here. Bring it around to the moment that we're in. Now, for those of you who attended the workshop last weekend, you learned how to utilize the cohort programming on your mobile devices to create interactive works. We will now hear from that exact same team on how to organize and develop your own practices when mixing technologies and mediums. So Jacob, take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, the first thing I'm going to ask everybody to do is to meet us over on the green circle. Join us in the green circle. All right, um, one of my goals for today is because we're here in VR together to, uh, as part of this session, just make, just experiment a bit with uh, social conversational dynamics in VR. Um, a first question is, can everybody hear me? Awesome. Uh, I love, one of the, my favorite things from sessions so far in VR has been the degree of interruptibility. Um, because I, I am a person who tends to like over talk. And so it's very, very useful if people are able to interrupt me. Um, I agree. So I just wanted to make sure, who was that? <laughs> Great, yes, <laughs> the right track. But for this, to, for this to be a thing, we have to be close enough that we can all hear each other without using the uh, amplify, you know, raise your hand to speak model. Um, so I'm gonna try that, but if at any point you find that you can't hear me, uh, please let me know and we can switch over to, you know, loudspeaker amplifying mode, um, which it feels like should just come on automatically if I do this with my hand, but there's a feature for later. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is a little physical uh, grounding in the space. Uh, so I would like us all to come onto the circle. You might be close with other people. We'll see how that feels. I know it's weird during COVID times. Come onto the circle and face the monolith. And we're just gonna do a little salutation to the monolith that Beth and her team and her participants put together for us. Um, so we're gonna start facing the monolith. Take a look around, make sure you've got enough space in your real physical space. Arms together, lean a bit to the right. Lean a bit to the left. Now, as your arms come down, just gently let your head tilt forward. And at some point, this will cause your body to spin around weirdly. Okay, just give it a moment to let your neck relax because you've been using it really hard holding up this VR headset. Drop your controllers, shake out your fingers a little bit, shake out your hands a little bit. I'm just gonna turn around so I can see what this looks like because I was curious. Great, if you're on t in 2D, then you can absolutely do all of this. Uh, you just, we just won't see you do it. Okay, bring it back up, overhead. All right. <sighs> Take a breath in and a breath out. Uh, the next thing we're going to do 
is repeat that, but we're going to finish up uh, lying on the ground um, because that's pretty much how 2020 is feeling so far. That's my postural response to 2020. So we'll bring our arms up and we'll roll down our spine and come to a position where you can see the large black rectangle over our heads. <laughs> All right. Can I ask uh, Aiden or uh, Alex to hit the go on that? Aiden or Alex? Okay. Talking, Jacob. Sorry, I just uh, I might have to. Uh... All right, I'm being instructed to keep talking. So one thing I was really curious about, um, from a from a product from a product ownership point of view, a lot of things don't get done, um, and so often my first response when I'm in a new technical environment or using a new piece of software is to hunt for the edges. What didn't get done? What did not get implemented? Um, and it's it's a bit of a way to sort of uh, s understand something by seeing where it starts to break, um, which is a principle that I use a lot. Uh, I'm probably going to suggest come back to the video if it's going to take a lot longer. Okay, give me give me uh, mm, thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. All right. <laughs> uh, let's finish off our physical warm-up with a little hand and wrist work. Uh, so the first thing we'll try is just figure eights. This is still holding your controllers. Great. And let's try some offering hands. So that's going to sweep in from the side, come up to the center. Sweep in from the side come up to the center. Great. Okay, it looks like we might be getting a second video. All good. <laughs> Can you, are you able to move that, Jacob? Which one? The, the new one that I just thrown up there. As it's Here, I, I got so, it, I got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, all right. So find somewhere where you can see this. I'm Jacob Mikievsky, and I'm a creative technologist. I grew up backstage. My first career was as a ballet dancer and choreographer. I've been coding since I was seven, and over the last couple years, I created apps in collaboration with some really interesting theater and dance artists. Cohort is a way to take the capabilities we've created together and make them available to more creators. The cohort development team is made up of myself, Luke Garwood, Amanda Baker, and Nabil Hassan. So what can you do with Cohort? You can load sound, video, and images into a custom app. You can borrow devices from us and load that app onto them for your show. Or you can use your own devices. Or you can submit it to the App Store and have your audience download it. You can trigger playback of sound and video on cue, either from our admin website on a laptop or phone, or directly from cue Lab. You can also cue text to appear and trigger device vibration. What can you do with this? Well, we can have a quick look at what some of our partner companies have done. It's Not A Box Theatre used Cohort to create a documentary theatre piece called Overseer, where storytellers share their stories in their neighborhood with audiences. Blue Milk Inc. used Cohort to enhance their theatre piece Cafe Sarajevo, using 3D 360 video to immerse audiences in locations throughout the Balkans. Peggy Baker Dance Project use Cohort to guide participants to all abilities and let them feel what it's like to invent and enjoy movement together. There's also some capabilities that have been used by our partner companies but aren't quite ready for public release yet. Adelheid Dance Project used push notifications and text cues to guide audiences around a huge indoor-outdoor site in their work lot X to create an augmented reality public installation and to offer closed captioning for deaf and hard of hearing audience members. I use cohort.
support in my work, Jackie, the augmented reality team to overlay projection style graphics and video onto a live performer. This cohort is open source and free for anyone to use. In addition to production usage and to be able to attend sites for quick work, it's really helpful for quickly testing out ideas and making prototypes. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out cohort.rocks or email us at cohortrocks at gmail.com. Thanks to our partner companies, to the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund, and to Heidi Strauss and Rachel All right. Now, if Public you're on the ground, just take, count, take a good 10 count to get up and work through that in a very deliberate way because your face is a bit strange right now. So we're going to slowly move back to our feet. Make sure we're not going to smash into anything in our space. And we're going to reconvene on the green circle. It seems like we have a few more people joining us now, so I will repeat what I said earlier, which is just I'm, try I'm testing this out without amplification um, so that we can see if it's possible to like keep a conversational flow going. Uh, if at any point, so that means we have to stay pretty close. Uh, if at any point uh, you can't hear me, uh, just say so, let us let me know, and we'll switch to amplifying and raising hands. All right. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention is that if you see me do weird movement like this, it is me checking my notes, uh, which I will do occasionally as we go. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you see me doing this, the same reason. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to kick this off. Um, that video provided a bit of context and background on cohort and what we do and what we're up to. Uh, personally, I'm Jacob, in case you missed that. <laughs> My colleague Amanda Baker is here from cohort right over there. Hey, look, I can point. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about product ownership. Um, my practice as an artist is grounded in movement, media, and code. I grew up as a ballet dancer, started programming as a kid, started making movies as a teenager, uh, and so those are that's kind of the territory that I play in. Uh, with cohort, I'm in more of a technical facilitator role. Some, sometimes I get called a technological dramaturg, um, and I've, I really enjoy helping other artists figure out how to accomplish things um, that they want to do technically. Uh, so before we talk about how cohort has conceived of and organized our product ownership roles, um, it's probably a good idea just to talk about what uh, sort of a traditional model of product ownership looks like in the tech industry. Um, and really, uh, sorry, notes again. Wow, this is very awkward. OK. Uh, an experience I had. Uh, as a live stream director, which I spent a couple years doing, mostly with dance on screen, um, I started to conceive of my role as a director as being the final person who was responsible to the audience for what we are, for the experience we're offering them. Um, and that, I think, is the best way I can explain or analogize the traditional idea of product ownership in tech. Um, the person who really should always have the user first in their head. Um, there's a lot of balancing different priorities, of course, but I think that that's a reasonable working definition of, of a product owner, is the person who bears final responsibility for the experience that's being offered. Um, in tech land, uh, that, that sort of role evolved out of the gradual failure of project owners. Um, and the, 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 the breakdown there is that product owners have a sense of continuity. They have a sense of, hey, our users have been are with us for five years, for 10 years. Uh, we need to make sure that we are still maintaining a consistent story for them. Um, and so project-based work tends to fall apart as organizations grow and get bigger. Um, it gets a lot harder unless you're doing the exact same type of project repeatedly, which would be sort of the case in a large, uh, a large national theater company. Um, it's organized on a project basis, but the projects themselves fall into very consistent slots uh, and very consistent formats. And so you can really apply like organizational templates. Uh, you know, what does each show need? Okay, great, we can use that paperwork and those functions across all the shows. Um, but as, as companies grow and as teams grow, and, in, and as we know from you know people in this industry who make the 
making sure it works, uh, our work doesn't really fall into consistent templates. Uh, okay, I'm going to try next reading. I just got a note that my audio is getting a bit glitchy, so I'm going to try turning on amplification. Um, as you can see, that doesn't work. Hello, probably I'm now much too loud. Uh, please keep telling me if, I, if my audio gets glitchy again, Aiden, and I will move closer to my Wi-Fi router. Um, Parallelme. Yeah, so our work tends to not fall into easy templates or easily repeatable patterns. Um, and so uh, product ownership emerges in those environments as a way to establish uh, lines of responsibility and, and also as a way to coordinate the activities of multiple teams. Um, a product owner in tech uh, will tend to have a team or teams that they uh, are essentially responsible for um, and will work really closely with the customer or the user or the client, uh, basically, however that, <laughs> that word gets changed a lot as we move between disciplines, audience, player, uh, participant, uh, attendee. Um, so that's kind of a, oh, and then the last thing I'll mention, which many of you are probably familiar with, is that the standard model of technical development is, is and software development is iterative development. And so the idea is that you are uh, here Radically, um, taking a chance, taking a moment and an opportunity to uh, continue evolving your processes as you are doing with as, Okay, I'm getting a message made in that I am really breaking up. And so I'm just going to go off heads up for about 30 seconds, move closer to my router, and uh, be right back. I apologize sincerely for this. Um, what I might actually do, if everyone can still hear me for a second, uh, is set up our first. Uh, me not talking exclusively activity. So I would love for you to, Amanda, I'm going to ask you to time keep for this. We're going to do an exercise called one, two, four, all. Uh, we're going to take a minute and I'd like you to think for yourself about an experience you had. Pardon me, checking those notes again. I'd like you to think about an experience you, you had, good or bad, where you worked with someone with technical skills or language or experience that you didn't have. Um, is that question clear? Is that prompt clear for everyone? Okay, great. Uh, so I'd like you to take a minute on your own to think about a specific occasion, again, good or bad. Um, hopefully I'll be back by then, but if I'm not, what I'd love for you to do is grab a partner and share those experiences. And we'll take a minute, we'll take a minute or two, uh, a minute, let's take two minutes for that. After that, Amanda will let you know the time. And please gather in groups of four around one of these cylindrical uh, cocktail tables and have a short discussion amongst that group of four about those experiences. Um, I'm gonna be right back in a moment. Is, is the ask clear? All right. Let's give it a shot. Be right back. Hi, my name's Milton. David. Can you hear me? How are you? <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. 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 Uh, what was the question? <laughs> I was muted. Um, let's see. Um, and, uh, uh, so again, work with somebody who has two. technical kind of knowledge about, uh, about uh, my partner could uh, be had a good or bad over here. Yeah. <laughs> Head scratch no, I mean, that's actually a good example. If you, actually, you know what that makes me think of is my dad oh, hey, used to drive, to be honest. Hi. 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 I was actually starting to think that any, any show I've worked okay. on, I work with people whose skills I don't understand, but not necessarily like the technical yeah. ones. But, but yeah, I guess by technical, you mean like um, playing with machines or technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I find a lot of what yeah. actors and directors do kind of mysterious. You probably have more than me. Oh, for sure. You know, you work a lot more than talent. had more. Uh, anytime yeah. I've I talked about um, good, bad, fantasy like systems where like technology was used Hello? instead of like um, you'll actually joke about how spoons are I'm trying to technology. figure out <laughs> what, like how far back <laughs> are we going? Was yeah, 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 yeah. 
like so spoons are technology. Are we not in enough for spoons? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the person I was working with, with all actually the makes me think of the Matrix. You know that scene where you know they, they go to the Oracle and they bend the spoons, and he says, "Oh, it's not the spoon that's bending; it's the universe around it." <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking about the Matrix to my daughter, which is my wife. I can follow that, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I definitely follow technology. technology and go back in and, and check it out. So I feel like um, my daily life. I really, really want to watch <laughs> It's just a constant reminder that I don't know what I'm doing. We are always a person who doesn't know. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I try my best. I really do, but. I just kind of throw it his way. <laughs> yeah. I just thought I couldn't say hi. You drive it. Looks like some game stuff without a partner. But it looks like also you might be connected. Okay. Oh. Yeah, of course. I think we're at time to send people for cables. I did not have amplification power, and I don't know how to get that. No. <laughs> Hello, friends. You are now at time. Please make your way towards your cocktail tables to discover more about each other. Thanks so much. Yeah. Jude, yeah. Jude Law. Jude Law's the actor. Yeah. Jude Law. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I think David Cronenberg's the director writer, isn't he? Isn't, isn't that? Well, no. I'm not sure. It was yeah, no, it was a sure. real leap for me to remember a name for the actor. <laughs> <laughs> Which film was that? Existence. Oh. It's a uh, horror thriller VR movie. Um, oh. About the launch of the VR system. I can hear you. Um, okay, good. And, uh, it's really good. It's really ridiculous. And okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Before, uh, it's been years since I watched it. Very aggravating. We really need to have a safe space. So even though I'm unmuted, the sound um, starts to cut out. It was like, like a kind of participatory experience where people would give him their contact information. And he went on a month long kind of journey with them. And they weren't sure when the end and when it began. It was all a lot better. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been more like Marissa. Like I don't really know much. Okay. And just figuring out how to get to this conference oh. was uh, plenty of uh, plenty of things to do for me in terms of technology, I think. But I feel like at my organization right now we're doing, we, we are going to be working with Cohort to, do, to uh, experiment on uh, augmented reality and ASL interpretation. And so, cool. thankfully, there are experts who are telling us how it was done in a positive way. Um, they ended up being really condescending about helping us. Um, and we're kind of like, well, I'll do it for you. You don't really need to know how to do it in the future. So that was a not a great experience. <laughs> and that's no, that's something that I've I've had in the past experience with as well. Sometimes people just kind of. Um, yeah, they don't they don't share it in an open way. Mm. Mm. That that sucks. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was sharing. Uh, I had a a positive experience where I was uh, filming a big musical number once for my web series. I'd never done anything that big or ambitious before. I had the biggest crew I'd ever worked with. I was directing. And um, but yeah, my cinematographer, like he has way more experience on set than I do, and so like I was just so great to have him there because he was able. To, he kind of had that sage advice uh, to be like, like, oh, you know, here's a thing that's going to be a problem. You know, think about this, think about that, and you know, like it was just he he never stepped on my toes, which he was very respectful of that, which I'm very different from your experience, I'm afraid. Uh, but yeah, and so like I really it was turned into being one of the best. Onset Hello, friends. It is time now to return to the big Ooh, green circle. <laughs> so thank you all for chatting. Please return to the big green circle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fill your name. To the green circle. I don't want to talk about it, okay? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> 
Told you I'm not technically <laughs> <I'm> watching you. <laughs> it's a great either. <laughs> I don't know which way to look. Oh, there I am. All right. Um, so I'd love to ask a couple of people to uh, share something interesting that you heard someone else say in the group, and you can summarize uh, or sort of be. It can be as small as you want. Um, if I could have a volunteer first. Nobody heard anything interesting in the last four minutes of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go. Okay, great. Whoever said that, go. Speak loud. Yeah, okay, sure. And so I was hearing uh, Jenny's story, and uh, she her story uh, she shared, it was a major pet peeve of mine and, and that happened to her very unfortunately where she was in a project where she was wanting to learn a new skill set for the 3D modeling she was doing. But unfortunately, the person they went to for advice uh, basically just kind of did it for them and didn't really, like, educate them. They were just like, here, you know, in a condescending way. And I just, I hate seeing that. And uh, so I'm very sorry Jenny had that experience. That's, that's what I got. Pet peeve of mine. That's actually fabulous. I would love to take a minute and, and dive into that just a bit. Um, everyone can still hear me okay? Cool. Um, so <laughs> I was talking with uh, Archana Rajan, who's also on our team at Cohort, um, and she works in quality assurance. Uh, so it's her job when I write code to figure out uh, or to, to try and break it, basically. <laughs> and we have a lot of fun in that role. Amanda and I have a similar working relationship. <laughs> um, and she describes this mentality sometimes from developers as essentially like a chuck it over the wall mentality, um, which is a bit like, hey, I have my, er my area of responsibility. It's very firmly defined. And I'm going to do my bit and then throw it over to the next person and not really think, like, that's it. That's good for me. I'm good. Um, and I've had this experience. I don't tend to have this experience as a developer, um, but I certainly had this experience with developers <laughs> or with other developers. Um, and one of the one of the things that Arch and I talked about um, were how do we talk, how do we get from these behaviors to talk about values that can help us, you know, like not just tell not just tell a collaborator or a developer that what they're doing isn't working, but how do we have conversations that we can try and be on the same ground and understand each other's values? Um, and one of the values that felt like a really useful thing to talk about in this case was stewardship. Um, and by that I mean, uh, it's the opposite of I'm going to build my thing and throw it over the wall to the next person whose job it is to work on it. Stewardship means that all of us on a project have the responsibility that that project needs to be able to keep going. Even if we, I mean, in theater, we talk about the bus factor. <laughs> um, but building the capacity of a team to do meaningful work on a project is all of our job. Um, and so a way to, a, a potential way that, we, that might be useful to talk to developers is to, is to say, do you really want this to just stop? Do you really want this to be something that only you can work on? Um, that felt like an interesting uh, value to talk about. Um, so a couple of the a couple of specific tactics around that um, around that value and that uh, sort of type of conflict um, might be questions like um, when you're talking to developers, uh, whether it's whether they're already on your team and or you're already in collaboration with them, um, or whether you're hiring, uh, think about looking for people who are excited to find a shared language. Um, and in theater, that's what we do. In theater, dance, create indie games. I'm pointing at Layla's. <laughs> but in these small creative project teams, um, that's a big part of it. And so we need to we need to choose the people we work with and and help the people we work with build skills around finding shared language. Um, another thing is that as a developer, I conceive of my job to include education. And that's mutual, to include, to include learning. Um, I, I do have a bit of a compulsive in love of uh, 
<laughs> learning from everyone around me and also educating everyone around me. And it's taken a long time to understand the socialization of that in the sense that uh, the intent can be very different from the impact. And I've worked with a lot of developers who, you know, came into the industry with that same mindset of like, if, you know, I'm going to share all the knowledge I can all the time I can, and then start to understand that that means that has implications in terms of how much space they take up in a group, in terms of how much space they take up in a conversation or a room. Um, and it's really hard for all of us, any, for all of us to find that balance. Um, so opening up those conversations can be, I think, really useful. Um, the last thing I would encourage as far as looking when you're looking for developers or if you're thinking about who you're already working with and how to help them become um, a better collaborator <laughs> is uh, that, oh, and my phone just lost itself. Great, there's a note. Right. Uh, our, my job as a developer includes being excited to learn things that are outside of my discipline. Um, and that is that feels really fundamental. Um, so I, I think it's really awkward to work with a technologist or a technical person that, who doesn't have that trait um, on, a, on a creative project team. I've just never seen that really work very well. Um, and if you talk to uh, Poster Lab's Andrew Sincere, I think he, he and I have had some conversations about that and, and came to the same kind of conclusion. Um, so that's the chuck it over the wall pathology. <laughs> um, but I think you take I, it. Yeah, next. Just to say also that that's incredibly common in theater, right? For any of us yeah. who have worked anywhere remotely close to industrial mainstream theater, the set, the, you know, first the playwright, you know, or probably first the commissioner, then the, you know, that we we work, the mainstream of theater works in an incredibly waterfall, hierarchical, chuck it over the wall framework. Um, <laughs> And and so it's not only when we're dealing with the technologists, but also when we're dealing with the artistic directors and technical directors and production managers and and you know harborfront center staff, <laughs> right? Like we have yes. to deal with those shitheads, or we don't, right? Or we use other spaces, but like that that exists in our field also deeply. Yes, and I, I, I have actually run into it as much there. Um, what, I, what is interesting to me is always that line where when you're building something, like I feel like the people who are in this environment here are probably people who bias towards making different things rather than making versions of things that at least are working in formats that you know are really well understood and well explored and well articulated. Um, and so I think that's always going to be the, to some extent the case when you're when you're um, working in new formats and when you're working with organizations that are designed around old formats. Um, I think personally, the good experiences I've had have mostly come down to having an internal an internal patron at the organization. Um, and so that those are some of those experiences would be with PIF, with Harbor Front, um, with the National Ballet. Uh, if you have an internal patron or champion of, of the project that you're trying to bring, um, that, sorry, I'm just getting little messages. Um, that's, that's really useful. And a warning sign is if you get assigned an internal patron who does not have any power, authority, or responsibility within the organization, they are not going to be able to help you. And so uh, th that would be the caveat that I would add to that. Um, I would love to ask, throw it back open and see um, what else, what other interesting things did you hear other people talk about during the conversation? Uh, we were jo uh, joking about how um, we think uh, technology, uh, as it's known, is uh, limited, and that everything has its own technology. So, joking about spoons and the Matrix, that, that spoons are a form of technology. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my, I think my favorite expression of that is technology is what we call things that don't work properly yet. Um, <laughs> 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 
paper is a fabulous technology that's really well understood and, and you know, we know what it can do and what it can't do and how it works and how to pass it around. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, other, other interesting things from our con from your conversations earlier? Go for it. It's already something that I heard more kind of like a question actually to you, if that's okay. Yeah. It seems to me that big sort of um, part of the conflict which might arise in the example that was brought up before, but also in the context of what you're talking about is the difference between the process of doing something versus actually just realization of a product. So in traditional, well-defined sort of theater, it's often a product-oriented thing because there's a clear script, there is clear delineated tasks or roles to greater or lesser extents for individuals to do. But it sounds to me like what you are talking about and the way that you're approaching your conversation about uh, development is more like devising in theater, where it's actually the process and outcome are sort of part of the same thing. And it's not, and even when you get to outcomes, it's more like this is how far we got. This is, it's it's yeah. endless versions of betas, some better betas <laughs> than others. Is, is software, that, is that software is never done. You just stop at a certain point. Um. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's a really good um, observation and a question. Uh, I think that a, there's an extent to which because software is a technology in that we don't know all about it yet and it doesn't exist perfectly yet, um, when we're making when we're making software, even if it's in service of something, even if I'm you know building a, a way for um, a show to you know like broadcast push notifications during a show, um, when we're making software, we're generally making something that hasn't been made before. Um, and so, to an extent, every software project has that, uh, uh, that difficulty of process and product become merged. Um, so, one thing I wanted to, to talk a little bit about is uh, the idea of scope. Um, because that's, a, that's kind of how, in technology land, these discussions get focused. Um, and how we can decide how to spend the time that we have. Um, so, can I just ask, uh, can somebody give me a, an attempt at a working definition of scope as you would understand it in your own practice? Don't worry, I just won't get someone other than me throwing an idea in there. How, if I say, if I say uh, the project scope, tell me what that means. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna volunteer somebody. All right, um, Milton. Oh, tell me a bit about, tell me what scope, what you think of when I say scope. Voluntold, okay. Uh, so scope as in uh, what are the furthest reaches of what is intended for the project? Love it. The furthest reaches of what is intended for the project. Now, I would love to just point out that this is so important in software. If you take a look around, how far do you think the gray toilet lit of Amazon goes on? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Effectively, probably mathematically forever-ish. How do you um, so stuff scope in becomes, VR? <laughs> scope becomes really, really important because when you're working with software, a lot of things are unbounded by the default. Um, and so having being able as a team to talk about what we are and are not going to do becomes really important. Um, a couple ways that I, these are a couple sort of bullet points that I found really useful to, to keep in mind when, when discussing scope. Um, the first thing is when you're talking to a technologist or to the, to the programmer, somebody with those with skills that you don't have um, and who you are relying on, um, a really, really important thing is that you not explain the solution that you want. A really, really important thing is that you explain the problem. Because if you, that is your first opportunity to get this person, this technologist or this, this developer, actually excited mentally, intellectually, emotionally <laughs> about, you know, solving this. And that's the, that's the energy that I think helps a lot. Um, so one thing is always talk about uh, the problem and not the solution first. Um, solutions are things that we can come up with together and attack together. Um, and so it's, I think it's, that's a first really valuable thing you can do. Um, does that question answer the question? Checking in. I'm really enjoying being a tech face to everyone. <laughs> um, another 
another thing, and, and this is a has kind of become a common or a, a slightly more common thing to in the culture is the idea of um, what is the what is the minimum uh, what is the minimum what is the smallest thing you can do what is the smallest piece of your concept or your idea that you can break off and tackle first um, and that's sometimes talked about in terms of uh, minimum viable product or MVP. Um, thanks for aiding me. Um, and the idea with an MVP is that you have to start somewhere. And your first, if you are working iteratively, your first few uh, leverage, the first few weeks of development or your first few days in rehearsal, um, you know, let's say I'm going into a devised theater process because I've spent like <laughs> over the last year I've spent, <laughs> over the last two or three years, I've, I think I've been in four substantial devised theater processes as a technologist. Um, that, that idea is partly about lowering expectations. Um, if you're in a devised process, do you really expect to get a lot of finished work done in the first two to three days? Anybody spend time in those processes, David? No, I'm seeing shake. Yeah. So that first that that first uh, time together is better focused on learning about each other, on uh, talking about scope, and talking about values, and talking about uh, you know developing shared language, learning from each other about you know how we work together. And so breaking off a very small slice of actual functionality. Um, so if it were this world, a minimum viable product is basically a floor that we don't fall through in the infinite depth. Um, that's enough for us to do everything we've done today, except for the, you know, having a nice little coffee service and being around. Um, so that's a, a really useful tactic when you're approaching a technological project. Um, there's two more things I'd like to mention when we talk about scope. Um, thinking in stories. Uh, if I say the word user story, put up your hand if that's a word you have heard, a term you have heard. All right. Okay. Um, David in the blue sweatshirt. Uh, can you tell me the context that you heard user story, so that you've encountered it? Sorry, I was muted. Okay. No worries. Um, I. Uh, I've heard it in uh, generally in terms of um, of like a narrative framework uh, for um, like game mechanics. Awesome. Okay. Yes. Uh, so just in case anybody didn't quite hear that, uh, in, in the context of a narrative framework around game mechanics, um, and so uh, for me, a user story is is a way to start uh, getting really granular without getting really technical. Um, and the Mad Lib structure that I tend to use is, as a blank, I want to blank so that I can blank. <laughs> and so what we get in there is a subject, so like the person, the, the role, the person, the type of user who wants to be able to do something. We get what they want to be able to do, and we get what that enables or why that's important to them. That captures a ton of information in a very, in one sentence. And you can compose larger, um, larger arcs for a user by by arranging those stories. Um, I would love to do a simple example of this. Um, based on your experience in all space VR during this conference, what is something you would like to be able to do that you have found yourself unable to do? Well, everybody wants to fly. Hey, okay, I want to be able to fly. <laughs> Who is saying this? It's uh, Chris. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> what's your, what's, how would you describe your role in all space VR? Um, uh, a new user. A new user, great. A newbie. So as a new user, I want to be able to fly so that, or because, can, 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 you, can you give me the, the because or the why on that? Um, I don't know, because it's human nature, it's, uh, it's exciting. Great, that's yeah. fine, that's good, that's enough. This does not need to be a long, long thing. Um, thanks, Aiden. Uh, so, as a new user in Altspace VR, I want to be able to fly because it's exciting. That is something that technologists on a team, 
that UX people on a team, that uh, spatial designers on a team, everybody can actually understand that. It gives them a person to anchor for that too, or a type of person to anchor that too. And it gives them a clear sense of the what and the why. Um, I've just been notified by Aiden that that is time. And this is the end of our workshop. Um, I, so, and I know that people out there are other things happening and people have stuff to go to. Um, I'm going to stick around in the world for a little bit. Uh, if people want to chat and catch up. Um, I do want to say a big thank you for, for joining us for this. Uh, uh, and yeah, if you want to stick around for a bit, that's great. If you have things to get to, no problem. Um, thank you so much for your time today and joining us. Thanks, Jacob. Jake. Thanks, Jacob.
very much. Wonderful. Have you tried any other like um spaces like Alt VR yet? In, in VR? Not really. I have a I've only gone to Rec Room, which is a bit more like you can like play games with friends. That looks fun. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious. It's it's not hugely different than all space other than like it has more features for interaction for for you know, like like games you would play with friends in a in a regular rec room but you know you can still talk you can still kind of gesture yeah yeah so, um, sounds good i'd like to see i'd like to check that out because i've got a cousin that I discovered who, who um, I think plays with VR, so maybe we can meet up. Mm. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I prefer to all space. You prefer rec room? Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, um, I'll check it out. Well, what are those things over there? The orbs? Those, right. those yeah. orbs, yeah. I think it's yeah. just a static. Oh. oh. <laughs> I was trying to interact with them earlier and I couldn't. Really yeah, they do look like the um, world. Yeah. yeah, they do. <laughs> they work. Kind of Western cultural way to see theater. But uh, yeah. I, it always frustrates me. It's like, I need to know every little thing about. about... <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to day four. Um, just going to uh, say a few things before we get started. Thank you for your patience. As uh, as you might know, PXR 2020 is brought to you by Single Thread Theatre Company and the Electric Company Theatre. We'd like to thank Toaster Lab and the Laguerre Center for the Entertainment Arts. We'd also like to gratefully acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund. We'd also like to acknowledge that we've organized this event primarily on the traditional and stolen territories of the Coast Salish peoples in Vancouver, BC. And I'm talking to you today from Kingston, Ontario, the traditional uh, hunting grounds of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, tonight, today, how are practitioners approaching the creative process for new content in XR performance? Is there a common language shared with other creative industries in the medium? What is the dramaturgical processes in XR? How do you create and innovate? Justin Garrett, one of the great minds from Team Toaster Lab, ah. is, is here to lead this conversation further. Let's give her a round of emojis, everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, man, you guys, it's so beautiful. It's like we're underwater, except there's hands. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we are super thrilled to have this conversation. We're going to try something slightly more interactive. Um, and just hold tight for a sec, and uh, we'll, we'll explain that more in a second. First of all, I'm Justine Garrett. I'm a producer from Toaster Lab and a co-founder. My specialty is in producing and writing for immersive and extended reality experiences. Toaster Lab creates place-based extended reality experiences. So my morning uh, was going to a park in Toronto with my two little kids and running around and doing 360 video and hiding from the camera. So complete opposite of this morning uh, is now, but I'm thrilled because it's all part of my own continuum of creative process. Um, I would love to introduce our amazing panel. Today we have five people. Um, immediately here is Megan Byrne, um, who is on our wonderful Toaster Lab Mixed Reality Performance Atelier Advisory Board, but I'll let her introduce herself. Oh, uh, Tanzi, Megan Byrne Nasikasan, Afatawako Sisan, Hamilton, Ontario, Nuchin. Hi, I'm Megan Byrne. I am Akhtawakla Sisan, or uh, Ontario Métis, and I am born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario, the traditional lands of the Six Nations. And I am a video game designer, and also I recently, uh, for the last two years, I was working as the digital and interactive coordinator for Imaginative, which is the world's largest Indigenous film media, like screen-based media film festival. And so I was the one who masterminded and created the Indigital space. And we did a lot of work to help create more spaces where Indigenous people can create VR or AR or anything that, you know, but in a way that they want to do it, not necessarily in a way that requires them to perform their indigeneity in a particular way. So that's me. 
Thanks so much, Megan. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. And then um, this wonderful Mohawk gentleman here is uh, Michael Wheeler, and he's going to introduce himself. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Michael Wheeler. Uh, I'm um, the director of artistic research at Spiderweb Show Performance and a co curator of OLDA, which stands for the Festival of Live Digital Art. Um, and my experience in VR mostly comes from us just trying to figure out how theater makers are using it right now. Uh, at Folder, we've presented an, a couple of VR pieces, in, including Violet, which I think um, you might have seen here earlier today. And we've done a couple of workshops, including with um, the Games Institute at the um, University of Waterloo and, and how playwrights can get involved. And so, uh, I don't know, I do a lot of work with um, online live digital work, but I feel like I'm still learning some of the basics of the VR and I'm really happy to be here learning more with you. Thank you. Um, Conrad Sly, right over here, um, right here in the hoodie with the purple, <laughs> purple outfit. Conrad, yes. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Conrad. I'm, uh, I'm based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, my background is in doing arch architectural visualizations for virtual reality tours. Um, but I've broken away from doing that and recently I've been working with Renaissance Opera on uh, doing a, a version of Orpheus uh, in virtual reality. We're, and we did a lot of like uh, real time motion capture and stuff like that. So it's been really fun. But thank you for having me. Amazing. Adnan, would you like to introduce yourself over here? Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Anand Rajaram. I'm in Tagarundo. Uh, this is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of, credit, of the Credit, the Huron, and the Wendat. Uh, I work primarily, I'm a theater person primarily, but I've been doing a lot of experimentation and, and uh, creating content in augmented reality. Um, virtual reality is relatively new, but there is a project I'm currently in residence at the Theater Center in Toronto, uh, developing a kind of an interactive uh, choose your own adventure kind of game um, in in a platform. We've been using Mozilla Hubs, but we're probably going to migrate to something else, but that's what I'm currently working on. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. So good. Uh, Jacob Zimmer, right over here. <laughs> beautiful nails in hand. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Jacob Zimmer. I'm on the territory of the Kwanlin Dun and the Tan Quachin Council in Yukon Territory, which is home of 14 First Nations with 11 self governing agreements. Um, I'm the artistic director of Nakai Theater. Up here is my, my job, and also to say thanks to Uconstruct and the Make Space um, here in town, which is probably one of four locations that has the internet capacity to um, reliably do this work. Uh, I'm, we are compelled to make theater that can only be made here, uh, which of course is a thing that goes, that can translate anywhere and including into these spaces. I've been a fan of augmented reality uh, since Glasses and The Walkman. Um, and I continue to be mostly interested in augmented reality and mixed reality uh, interactions of human bodies with device with uh, phones that then can actually see each other also in space. And so we're developing a conceptual piece that, at least at the moment, is a is a game for uh, a mixed reality uh, with technology that doesn't quite exist yet in the phones. Thank you so much. And then Alex. Um, okay, great. I have some exciting news. We have so many people here that there's a second shard that Alex is um, talking from, and also here too. Alex, hello, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, coming to you live from Shard Two. Uh, my name is Alex Doe. I'm with a Singing Thread <laughs> Theater Company. Uh, I'm on the territory of the Coast Salish peoples right now, and um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in immersive theater. And uh, I've recently come out here to Vancouver to study. Uh, game design and uh, VR creation. Uh, it's. I just want to say thanks everyone for coming and doing this crazy thing over the last two weekends. It's been so awesome to have you here. And uh, so, yeah, that's me. Great. So um, we because we do have thanks, Alex. Thanks everybody. So this is our amazing group assembled here. Um, first question that I want to ask everyone is what has been your biggest failure? in the creative process of making extended reality. It was like, whoa, embarrassment. Now you get to share it out loud with everyone here before we break into smaller groups. 
Anyone want to start? Uh, I, I, I can uh, start. Yeah, yeah let's go for it. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, Conrad. Okay. Uh, when I was doing my uh, master's degree at the Center for Digital Media, uh, one of the projects I was put on was working with uh, a water slide company who wanted to explore the potential of doing a virtual reality water slide um, <laughs> experience. <laughs> And wow. uh, but like the challenge that we had to solve was tracking a headset over a great distance. Um, uh, and at the time of doing this, there wasn't really a mobile device um, or, or there's just one mobile device capable of doing this, which was, which was uh, the Lenovo Tango phone. So we obtained oh one God. of these and, and we were able to do it, but my God, uh, user testing this thing, um, <laughs> I did it hundreds of times and I think my equilibrium was uh, was shot for a couple weeks after doing that. <laughs> but, you know, like it, it's just kind of one of those situations where, you know, water slides are awesome already. And it was, it, we were just kind of scratching our heads as to, you know, why would you need virtual reality in a water slide? So I like, there's just constantly that question in the back of our minds. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if it was a failure because we were able to achieve what we, we did, but uh, I don't think I would, in, like the potential for, for like an eye injury uh, just seems very high. So, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, does anyone else, like that's pretty spectacular. I really love hearing that. Yeah, why anyone else have anything? That? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I wish mine was a, yeah. 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 Go ahead, Jacob. Um, I don't know. It's an extended technology thing, but just all the problems of testing, having tested a, a one-off performance and having it work perfectly in an empty room um, that relies heavily on Bluetooth and wireless. Uh, and mm. then, of course, it doesn't work with an audience um, because Great. all of, right, like it's just one of, one of those like, oh, right, that. Um, <laughs> that ability to do a dress rehearsal doesn't include having a hundred phones using Bluetooth and wireless. Um, Wonderful. And, and actually being in a conference where you can't tell people to take their phones off. Or, you know. Of course, Whoa. naturally. So um, because we have such a great group, I am actually going to encourage everyone to split up next for our next portion. And just to keep it wild and interesting for our panelists, two of you are going to go to the other shard. So you're going to follow oh. Liam oh. right here in the green top. Okay. Um, are there two volunteers that would like to go away? Oh, Jacob? Okay. That seems intense. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll jump oh, Jacob and Megan? Okay. okay. I love um, it. But wait, wait, wait. Before you go, stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> before you go, I have to ask you a question that you're actually going to discuss. So, Jacob. Oh, I'm gonna like take my headset off, wake up my computer. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, so I can you ask your question. Oh. Um, yeah, go for oh. it. What were you gonna say, Alex? I was gonna say, panelists, make sure you turn off your megaphones. Otherwise, all we're gonna hear is you talking. Yeah, yeah. Don't do, don't yeah. do that. Okay, so um, Jacob, my my question for you as we break up into smaller groups is, um, what is the commonality for you between other media that you've worked in? and the XR creation process. Can you handle it? Sure. And differences, good? Okay. And then Megan, before you go, um, like how, how do you create? Are you alone? Do you collaborate? What's the, what's the process been like right now? Um, especially in the last six months, what's your creative process been like? Like well, physically and yeah. A lot of crying. I mean, like, that's why we're here, right? It's just so we're not crying alone anymore. That's like the XR 2020, don't cry alone. Um, so don't cry alone. Don't cry alone. Okay. So that's what Megan will be chatting with. So bye. bye. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you soon. Have fun in the other shard. Okay. You're going to follow Liam in the other shard. Okay, great. And then now what's going to happen is that with the rest of the folks that are here, what I would love to do is have you follow uh, the three remaining panelists. Conrad is gonna hang out right here um, in this area. <laughs> and Michael Wheeler is gonna go on the other side here. There's a snowy area. 
So if you like to chat with Michael Wheeler for the next few minutes, you can go out there. And Adnan, you are going to go out the front door, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, great. So what I would love it to do you to do is if you would like to follow Michael Wheeler, please go out this side door and follow him for a chat. Conrad will be right here and Adnan will be right here. And then I have to ask you a question. Okay, before you go, this is the big, big part of it. Hold on. Okay. Um, so Conrad, how, how, how do you find like creating a timeline for this work? Do you use a specific process, like timeline process, like related to software or is it more fluid or do you have hard stops those sorts of things like how do you create a timeline for getting this work done yeah. seem good you got it yeah you're good yeah. okay so conrad will be chatting about it here and then um i have a question for michael wheeler Do you, what's the dramaturgical process for you in supporting people um in working in xr and for spider web show and then adnan where do great ideas come from what do you think is like a great <laughs> worthy idea <laughs> for creating an XR? Okay, great. Good? Thanks. Got it. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go. Um, you guys have a few minutes to enjoy, and then we'll call you back after the conversation. So Adnan again is going out the front door here. Michael is going to the snowy area, and Conrad will stay right here. Okay, I'm gonna head out this way. Hey. Race ya. I'm gonna move very slowly to the snowy area. <laughs> Cool. Um, I think probably over here might be a good way to chat, and there's also a couple firecrackers over here we can probably check out. Oh, that's where you up to. How do you know how to fly in this world? I thought you weren't allowed to fly in this world. Ma, uh, uh. I didn't throw the snowball. That You're wasn't me. Hopping. I, I'm just gonna jump Anyhow, down. Anyhow, uh, can everybody hear me? Is it okay? Give me a thumbs up or something. Great. Um, so I think the question posed to us is, what is the dramaturgical process that Spiderweb Show has? And I, I'm less interested in talking about myself and more maybe just generally about digital dramaturgy, especially I see Beth here. Yeah, Beth is a digital dramaturg. Um, and so I hear that term around a lot. I guess maybe I'll start off um, the conversation by saying uh, dramaturgically, what we've kind of started to understand at Spiderweb Show is um, that we copy like um, a software development model based around alpha, beta, go. Um, and so um, for those of you not familiar with that, kind of most apps now when you're being developed are in alpha when they're kind of doing internal testing and then beta when they're um, tested against uh, an actual kind of set of people. And then when an app is ready to launch, it, it's, it's, a, it's go, it's in a go stage. And so and the only way that we've adapted that is to, I just want to get this together and work. Um, is um, we've changed the word golden to go or golden to go for us. So I guess uh, apps when they launch are golden and, and at, at a full go they go when they go. And so the way that we've been curating the festival is that we often program festivals twice. Uh, and so you'll see a work in alpha or beta, an unfinished work, and then we'll program it again um, in the second year as a go as a finished work. And so what we're asking audiences to do in that capacity is. Um, understand themselves as being more complicit in the creative process and that the feedback that um, creators get kind of like actual feedback and just generally the how it went for the creators 
feeds into um, the creative process. I think of it in the original things. Um, and I, I should say that um, those works that we have programmed in two years in a row, uh, almost uh, exclusively, those are the ones that have been picked up by other presenters. Um, and so we're feeling that it's a strong model because we're seeing we're seeing those works that are at Folded twice um, that presenters are then ready to trust them and pay money for them down the road. Um, so that's my opening gambit. Maybe I'll go to Beth since we're talking about dramaturgy and your digital dramaturgy. Do you have any philosophies on what that means? Um, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Yeah. Okay, you great. okay, good. Oh, now everyone's mm. looking at me. I'm going to stand up. Um, mm. uh, yeah. Can anyone I, else talk in this world? <laughs> no one else can talk? Really? No. I, I can talk. talk. I think you can talk as long uh, as you're unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I can hear you. Okay. Um, great. Awesome. Um, philosophies. Um, yes, I think a lot of the philosophy comes around um, a broad spectrum and deep understanding amongst all creators, too, about these tools um, so that it's not a, a, a hierarchical or, or a dictatorship of like, this is what we're going to do with these tools or someone turning to me and saying, this is what we're going to do with these tools. Um, that there is a deep exchange of, of knowledge and, and an understanding of how the tools work. Um, with, not that you have to get into the code, but and, and with that <clears throat> comes time. Uh, and I think giving it, which is what's so interesting um, about the Folda example, is um, the time given to this work because because so many of the forms are so new. I think time is a big part of that philosophy, and actually mm. letting it be and and figuring it out as you go, and then letting it exist and sort of continue to exist in that way. I think that's pretty key. Um, yeah. And experimentation, like the philosophy, like it, it's not a philosophy, but it's just a way, but this idea of experimentation and letting us have that time to, to be able to figure out what it all means, right, on all the, all the different aspects of what digital dramaturgy is, which is a developing thread of dramaturgy. Mm -hmm. um, something that I feel like Jacob kind of hinted at and in his introduction is that with this work, because interactivity is almost necessarily baked in, not just the VR, but almost almost all kind of digital works, uh, you can feel like you have something that you've made that's really cool, but then since people start interacting with it, it gets broken really quickly or different things happen in ways that you never expected. And so I feel that's kind of a, a way that is like fundamentally different than creating a piece of theater for a physical audience where you can kind of create the show and it's going to be the show when you present it. You obviously the energy from the audience changes, and you get that feedback. But you can still kind of repeat it every night, whereas that's not necessarily the case once you start involving interactivity. And so there's like a, a testing of, of interactivity that's kind of required. Um, yeah, two spirit trickster. Yeah, well, it just kind of makes me think of the the essence of of art and art practice, and that as soon as you make a work, whatever that is. It's up to the interpret the interpretation and the way it exists is always going to be in the person who perceives it. So it's always going to be out of the hands of the creator as soon as it's being perceived by anyone else. Uh, whereas like within interactive, more interactive works uh, like digital, that's like pushed even further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> philosophy on dramaturgy and what it means in all of these kind of weird XR spaces here. I mean, one thing that I, you know, was something I didn't mention in my bio is I also teach at a university and so I teach these things to young people. And um, one thing that I find that I'm really training them on is how to do feedback. Like that um, if we're going to work in this iterative devel development model, the space between the iterations is as good as the feedback that you get. 
Um, so like, for example, this year in my class, I just started right away doing an online digital project. Not because I was particularly interested in the project, but I wanted everyone to make something really quickly and get used to giving feedback and start to understand what good feedback is and what helpful feedback, because that's that that the thing that iterative development requires is good feedback. Does anyone have any philosophies on like how to evaluate a digital work when it goes out there? Any experience with that sort of thing? Maybe maybe what you learn from it. Right. Rather than, so, can you all yeah. hear? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure I'm looking where the person is talking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know it's hard sometimes. Um, yeah, I'm th I was thinking, especially in relation to students, it it you know the intent is one thing, but um, you know there's there's failure and there's success, but but what did you learn from it, and you know. I, I'm thinking that that would be a good indicator for students, especially. I mean, for all of us, really, because it's, yeah, I mean, you know, what I try to tell them is is uh, failure is fine in my class, like, mm -hmm. and that this yeah. kind of fail fast philosophy, which is kind of in the tech entrepreneurial kind of way of doing things right now. Like, what I try to encourage them is like to see what their project, not with a pilot project where they would plan it forever and then eventually like deal their project yeah. to try to you know do a minimum viable product uh, prototype right away test it against reality and get feedback that way as opposed to kind of being really precious and build it kind of over a period of time i found that to be more successful brian you built uh, mm -hmm. digital things what have been, what's your philosophy been as you try to test them you just had a show this summer that was all digital at pg yeah yeah, um, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like any AR or, or PXR stuff, but it was all through Zoom, um, mm. highly interactive through Zoom. Mm. Um, I guess if we're talking about like dramaturgy of feedback, as an artist, I think when, Michael, you talk about the minimum viable uh, product, um, iterating stuff, and even Raven, when you're talking about like, when we become hyper interactive um you can really only make one change at a time if anyone like is on the sourdough bread hype you know you want to make one one change to that mm. recipe before understanding mm. um you, you know you can't you can't make five because you're you kind of don't know like what it will do if you if you think like oh well no one's participating or no one's participating in the way we want to um mm. It really, I think, in terms of participatory work, which when translates online is about like, how do you get people to engage in a way that you think would be more effective than, um, you know, how they're originally doing it as you're going through, you know, alpha, beta, right. blah, blah, blah. And so can I ask you, Brian, like very specifically, so when you had your show, how did you do a dress rehearsal? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I I had a large team, so we would have to rehearse for each other. So what you end up getting is like you don't, as you rehearse, you don't get to do the full show because mm. you know there are eleven performers, but only you know like four of them could we could do without them just having to completely imagine what the audience would be doing. That way, you know, each of them at least have one other person that they can react to. Um, the dress rehearsals were really weird. They were always, like, so, so very difficult to do without an audience. Um, uh -huh. Which, when we did in person, was a lot easier because we could have, we could invite people in and do those play tests. But online, it was a little bit harder, um, just in terms of, like, time management yep. to get people to come. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough. <laughs> um, one thing uh, that I've noticed that's, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, please. Or, uh, I was going to go in a different, well, I think part of what, um, uh, strikes me in particular, like, um, I do a lot of, uh, theater production, uh, as a, a playwright and a director and a, and a producer, a festival, uh, artistic director, and it really strikes me that this this medium brings with it a tremendous new 
um, uh, aesthetic, dramaturgical uh, opportunity and burden that I do think that everything, you know, when we have actors on a stage, I mean, we've been talking for decades now about the text of an actor's body, right? And that, you know, different actors' bodies bring inherently in them a text. And we, as an audience, are seeing both the character and that performer's, the, 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 the performer's body and the text that accompanies that body. Um, and we make our meaning from the collision of our world and all those worlds. And in this space, I find that there's a whole new aesthetic burden, uh, or I, mean, I use that word um, not necessarily uh, negatively, I think that a burden can also strengthen us, but the idea that everything that we have as creators, a high degree of control over what everyone looks like, about how everyone moves, about what everyone's face and bodies and all of those pieces are shaped like, what they sound like, and, and break down to the trees. I mean, the shapes of these houses, these kind of you know beautiful Swiss Alps houses, right? Like all of this stuff is heavily embedded in a text, and and we the whoever creates the space has control over those texts to a degree, and and presumably over the next. Couple Hi, of years, sorry to interrupt everybody. More about more uh, five more minutes of chatting, and then we'll come back together. It's just a really interesting challenge. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot of God mode kind of things going on that are that are like ethical pitfalls. Has anybody kind of discovered themselves kind of being moved around that way, like where they felt kind of uncomfortable by being just a peon in a world where you can be shuffled around? <laughs> it's well, I think because I don't code. A lot of things are already um, created, and they didn't. They weren't created by me. So whoever mm -hmm. created them had a particular bias or a particular um, set of, I don't know, um, values, and it's all encoded into the world. It's encoded into how your avatar looks. It's encoded into the choices that you have. You know. So there's a, a yeah. There, there, it's it's kind of a, a world that that's um, really almost predetermined. You have choices, mm -hmm. but but they're kind of, there's a limited choice, set mm -hmm. of choices. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, you know, I feel really weird about the fact that I chose what I look like right now, which is not what I look like at all in reality. <laughs> and then I showed up here and I realized that most people I see <laughs> look like kind of how they look like. <laughs> And <laughs> this is my style. You've really changed. You've really, your queens has really changed you. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. uh, but I, I appreciated like the opportunity to kind of look different because you know I probably teaching the queens this would be a weird look. Too. But but you know here I thought it was fine. But then Clayton put a bunch of selfies up and my partner saw them on Facebook and she was like, "This is very weird. Everyone looks like themselves, but you. Like, what are you doing here? Maybe you should build a new one." <laughs> <laughs> So that's interesting. Well, and this is, it's <laughs> Camille, it sort of goes, there was a similar thing was raised even at the, at the talk that you were at mm -hmm. yesterday about that. And, and, and I know from people who, mm -hmm. um, like I have a, a VR artist friend who builds avatars and she went looking for, um, she's a black VR designer and she went looking for black hair and couldn't find it. And the so she ended up having people, to do yeah. that labor herself, right? And then she crowdsourced mm -hmm. it and now there's like this wicked library. But it's it's Ooh, that changing. It. <laughs> it, I'll totally, I'll, I'll hook you up with it. It's, it's awesome. Um, but Great. it's those pieces, right? It's getting it's yeah. getting women into tech. It's getting it's diversifying yeah. the tech so that yeah. yes, the code yeah. is is diverse itself. Because it's hard when you are only dealing with drop down menus. Um, yep. How diverse can you make the trees? How do yeah? Like it's yeah, it's a it's and a it, big yeah, problem in our bodies. Yeah. You know, uh, it's it's an embodied experience to a certain extent. But then again, you know, there's only particular bodies that. Mm -hmm. are allowed into the space, you know. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that, that I, 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 oh, I was just going to say that, you know, I do, I do remember experiences here better than I remember a Zoom call. Yes, yes. That's like, true. Yeah. That's hey, very everyone, true. I was going to say, please try to make your way back to your, you. your Shard's main area. 
where we began the discussion. Short. So it should be near the uh, um, completely disgustingly messed up tables. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just finish by saying that I was very um, shocked because or just disappointed in myself. Yeah, you guys are like in business here. Yeah, you you win. <laughs> you win the discussion here. She's oh, still she's still amplified. Oh. No, um, she's not. Ta she's she to wasn't talking about else. No. Oh. I mean. The so weird tall. thing when I went to um, Zuckerberg's <laughs> kind of talk on the about <laughs> what Facebook's going to do, and I was turning around so I can he's like, on people it. don't remember <laughs> nice. uh, yeah. Zoom. We, that's why I want everyone to have their meeting with VR so they can remember their meeting. And I was like, I don't right. want to embarrass Mark with anything. No, but he's right. Oh, shall we go back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, this right. is great. I wish we could walk and talk. Totally. This is. Like, can I zoom here? Let's see if I match your speed. I can kind of talk with you while we walk. Is that even possible? Sort yeah, of. So. This is like a little bit nauseating. I can't remember. And I keep going, <laughs> <laughs> keep like running into you and Brian. And now I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Brian, yeah, how did really... you set yourself to smooth yesterday? Oh, it, it's under settings. Oh. Yeah, it's like under settings. It's jerky. It's way, it's way better than the jerky thing. Oh, now I'm in Camille's eyes. Camille's eyes. <laughs> this is so. <laughs> this is so like, I just randomly descended my own in mind, found myself in the, in the audience. <laughs> really okay. nice. Yeah. Awesome. Looks like we're all getting together here. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody. We're all right. solo. Hey everybody, thanks for coming back. Honestly, oh, oh sorry, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, like, what I'd love to do have like a wow moment with like the audio. Now is to hear back from the individual groups. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna hear from the other shard if there's someone over there. No. Anyone? Bueller? Okay, we'll move on. Um, so we had Adnan's, Conrad's, and um, Michael Scoops, and if there's someone who wanted to uh, share from uh, the group with Michael Wheeler talking about dramaturgical processes, that would be great. Oh, um, yeah, we forgot to nominate someone. Does anyone from our group have a photo of this? Or, you know, I thought we would nominate someone, but I guess I forgot about the technical challenge of that only I can amplify my voice from this group. So I guess I will report from us. Um, Everyone talking to you. Sure, okay, so go we, for were it. Talking about, we were talking about dramaturgy. I think some of the things that we talked about was um, iterative design being more key um, to, to, to digital XR exploration so that you can test things. Jesse, are you hearing something? Yeah, I can hear you guys talk. Okay, great. Okay. We can't hear. Oh, well, maybe else I'm not talk. on air though, also. <laughs> are you I'm on, on air, air, Michael? I'm amplified now. Yes. So that everyone working? should hear me. In can you shard. raise your hand or emoji if you can hear Michael talking? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you're good now. Cool. So we talked a bit about kind of iterative design, uh, failing fast, like trying to find ways to get um, user feedback, and that in this kind of world, like if you you can create something, and Jacob hinted at this in his opening remarks, but until you've tested it on an audience, that's different. Um, that's brought up uh, in terms of digital dramaturgy, like um, a less hierarchical process where people are working together to kind of come up with um, shared ideas and, and values to the creative process. And we talked a little bit just about like the choices that you can't make in this world, but like fundamentally or any world, like when you enter a virtual space, a lot of the choices are made for you in a way that they're not in, in, in just negotiating that as well. and 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 kind of making sure that the tools are out there to represent kind of anyone in any perspective that they might have. That's me. Uh, awesome. Conrad, I heard there was a lively discussion in your group. Uh, oh, a yeah. different flavor. You know, it was actually a lot of the same topics we covered. Was it? Uh, yeah, like, you know, failing fast, iterative, uh, in terms of managing timelines of production. But also, mm -hmm. I think one of the most important points that we sort of came to was to you know find an early point of relation with regards to you know if you're approaching um 
doing a virtual reality production of some other kind of production, like let's say opera, for example. Um, having Debbie bring forward what the, what the production cycle for a typical opera is from the outset, it helps us more, um, like the rest of the team background was quite technical in terms of um, our understanding of game design and, and, uh, and producing game experiences. So having her bring forward this like opera uh, production timeline for us to understand and, and relate mm -hmm. to, it really helped uh, demystify the process for her. And we were able to find a language to navigate uh, the timeline and, and to make sure that she understood problems that could arise on the constraints, uh, as, uh, as Wheeler mentioned about um, working in virtual reality. Uh, there are a lot of constraints. Right, uh, well, a lot more than mm -hmm. in the real world. So it's just it's very interesting how uh, how similar our discussions ended up uh, being. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Megan. Did you end up having any time to chat with uh, your group? Yeah, I well, I mean, a little. We kind of just like went around the circle. I got really lost. Um, so that's shards. What are you gonna <laughs> yeah, do? Shards. Uh, I mean, we mostly kind of talked about how you know a lot of us have been alone. Um, even though we are working in groups, how because of COVID, mm -hmm. we went from being like near people to just sort of having to be, there's a lot of basements. A lot of us are in basements. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was happening. Uh, yeah, and it was like, uh, it just kind of echoed a lot of the stuff that I kind of was going through. Um, but yeah, I feel like I wish we kind of had more time because I really wanted to start going into like, why are we... Why are we working alone anyways? Because when you're working in VR, oftentimes you're not literally collaborating together uh, for majority of the development process. You're each sitting at a booth, kind of working on your own thing and sharing what you've mm -hmm. done. Um, whereas like with theater, you, sometimes you, like, you need like a multiple hands just to put something together. So uh, that's something I've always been thinking about lately with VR is just like we've lost a lot of the hands on but we're still building like these giant sets and stuff like even this space like this would have been like yeah. one person at just doing it by themselves so are we losing anything that way that is what happened yeah <laughs> yeah alex is amazing <laughs> um thank you so much jacob did you want to chat about your group um sure i was also got a little lost in the shards and uh and so then chatted a lot or, or blathered a bit um I we talked about I talked about play being the similar process the thing that is similar to me in creative process one is coming basically from clown and it, these are objects mm. and so you pick up every oh, object wow. and you do 8000 things with it and every object is good for doing 8000 things none of which the designers meant um and so I sort of approach that here as well um, that, you know, this, you know, this gives me more joy than the, you know, we're not in the same room, but the fact that I can put my hand inside a light, um, means I want to play with that and figure out things. Um, we talked also about, you know, sort of my perception that this stuff is, is quite hard. The interaction of this is quite hard. Um, I'm certainly aware of the difference between my creative practice up here in the Yukon of zero cases and not very good internet and how that is mm -hmm. actually, that is more and more growing the disconnect between myself and Southern folks um, in, in good and bad ways, right? I don't, I don't have a pressure of not being able to go outside. Um, we can do shows around fireplaces and we have not, you know, th those things are, are more viable. Um, but that creative sense of play is the same. I think the mm -hmm. opportunity in VR to, for me to play offsite is really one of the exciting things. So can I use this? I can't play with giant, it's harder to play with giant puppets in an abandoned strip mine um, in real space, but maybe I can build that space in VR and do the playing in VR. And then once we're doing the show in the mine site, um, we know how long, how big the giant puppet needs to be to read at a distance because we've done sort of perspectival stuff in VR. And that's really exciting to me as a maker who wants to work in places that are hard to get to. Great. 
That makes so much sense. And also, like, I'm just wild with jealousy. Like, what, what are friends in person? Together. And what's, what's very weird is, like, we get to, like, we do have, you know, the because of the mining world, we have a huge amount of photogrammetry and data scans That's of so the entire territory. Right? We have a wow. huge amount of data of the land. Um, many of it controlled by Canadian companies who have huge human rights violations, um, both here and in South America, so that complicates it. I speak to you from the Gold Core Educational Room. Um, yeah. Um, so that's all the entanglement that is the North, um, and huge amounts of government funding, and we're just here to prove that we own it. Um, but also with really bad internet. <laughs> You're doing great now. Anna, I heard you had um, a far-reaching discussion over in your corner. Uh, we did, yeah, yeah. Um, it was a, a discussion. I mean, primarily, like, the technical demands that are so new to all the technical as well as aesthetic considerations of the VR. I integrated it into this through American reality. And everything that I've been creating from the place of someone who would have little technology, not massive amounts, little exposure to that, not be cognizant already. And so a lot of my creation were paid for both audience and other performers that I'm collaborating with, all collaborators, being able to not have to receive their programs to figure how to create and how to apply basic theatrical principles within these worlds. So I'm quite interested and fascinated by how much more I can do with this. Mm -hmm. I start from the place of what I know about from what I don't know. And I was able to like make significant advances um, without feeling like I'm, I'm held back. And, uh, I think that's primarily what we use for that. Yeah. You're, a t you're a tiny bit garbled for me. I'm not sure for other people, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying a little bit. Um, there are there other questions? Yeah, I'm gonna come over here. Oh, pop, pop. Okay. Did you have a question over here? No. Okay. Sorry, that was kind of aggressive. So, anyone have a question for the panel? Any hands up? No. Okay. So my my question, my final question well, for the group here. One, one, oh, one did I ask you one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Go for it. I'm amplifying you. Um, I, uh, should I wait or can I? Sure. No, yeah, go for it. Talk, talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask about <laughs> how you um, negotiate intention uh, for a piece um, and as well as with technical stuff in mind. Um, Are they talking? How do you create with that intention and then yeah. also a knowledge of what kind of audience there is and how different the audience is in a technical space? Are they amplified? I'm trying to amplify um, them next on. to me. Is that working? Nope. It might nope. not go to the shard. Yeah. Oh, it might not go to the shard. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Maybe, Maybe just um, repeat the question. Should we repeat yeah. the question uh, for, again? for okay. Okay. Yeah. If you can tell me, uh, tell me the question. I'll try to repeat it as best I can. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, how as creators do you start with a project and its intentions, and how is it affected by the interactivity of technology and audience? Okay. So, how as creators do you start with an intention, and how is it impacted by um, the technology and audience. Did I say that right? Is there more? Yeah. Okay. That's about great. it. That was that was the question. Okay, great. So what was that? <laughs> how do you start with an intention and then like for a piece, and then how is that impacted impacted by both the technology that you're using and the audience? For it. feels like an essay. You have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael, go for it. If you have an answer, go for it. 
I do, I do think that kind of that question speaks to a way that like all the performing arts are shifting, not just like XR performing arts. Whereas like we're shifting out of like what I would call like an author model of arts production mm -hmm. where you have like a kind oh, yeah. of a, a genius at the top of a pyramid whose vision then kind of spreads through all the different departments that are below that kind of auteur at the top of the pyramid. And that all of this work is becoming much more collaborative, much more consensus based. And so um, like what your vision is is less important than like what the collective's vision is. And that also mm -hmm. um, the interactivity and then empowers each participant to have a different experience, which might not be anything that any of the artists have envisioned. And so it's like a really big letting go of intention. I love that. Yeah, Megan, did you want to say something? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know how to undo that. Uh, <laughs> I guess Click it also, again. Oh, oh, there it goes. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I guess also to that, um, one of the big things that like when I was doing game design, uh, and UX and UI design was that, uh, the big thing about like ideas are, okay, this is going to sound harsh, but like ideas are worthless, but it's the execution of that idea that gives it the idea its value. Um, and so I have working in so many different fields, like education and edutainment and that kind of thing is like, you get a lot of people who are like the big idea. I have these huge ideas, but then there's no plan for execution or there's a refusal mm -hmm. to sort of like give over that plan, that idea to the group in order to actually yeah. like execute it in any kind of way. And so I'm actually, I am seeing that kind of shift away, but also like in the indigenous spaces, there's a lot of like VR, that's being given just like the filmmakers and they're having a hard time of like transitioning their skill set. And I think that has mostly to do with like the vision of the the screen. So like mm -hmm. a VR, like the screen is all around you essentially, even though it's technically just in front of you, where like with a film, it's it's in a fixed location and you're always like gotta look at that point. So I think also there's a bit of a shift in that people are coming with preconceived visions of how the screen should function moving into vr and having a hard time translating that idea into the 360. does that make sense <laughs> perfect and yeah. yeah anna and did you want to add to that uh, yeah i i also the way i interpreted the question that you asked is do you start with an intentionality of the project that you want to and then figure out how to how to achieve using technology. And for me, rather than being hindered by my lack of experience or knowledge in the technology, I'm starting with the thing that I know. So my intentionality is necessarily bound to my knowledge of what the technology is. I will achieve the thing that I want. So I, uh, you know, the more that I learn about how it functions, the more I can expand my idea. It's kind of like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're oh. just super garbled. I'm so sorry. Sometimes it actually oh. takes like leaving and coming back, but we are actually at time and I hate to end on that note, but I also want to, so I want to end a note on a complete gratitude for our panelists and for the group here for being so open and having such a great and far reaching conversation. And hopefully this will lay some groundwork for a more collaborative, dare I say, feminist uh, approach to creation in XR. Thank you. And thank you very much, Justine. Can we give her some clicks for conducting this brave <laughs> experiment? She was the chief person in the lab for sure. Thank you so much, Justine. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Uh, um, everyone take 10 minutes. And then um, the, the, final, the final future note is um, where you came in. It's a giant glowing portal where the basketball net used to be in Central. So in about 10 minutes, take a break, get some water, and then we're gonna get started for our final event. Thank you very much. Thanks guys.
we're going to get started. Thanks so much for joining us for our, uh, our final presentation, our, what we are calling our future note. Not an end note, but a future note. And uh, I wanted to uh, just start off by saying that PXR 2020 has been brought to you by Single Thread Theatre Company and Electric Company Theatre. We want to thank our community partners, Toaster Lab and uh, the Center for Entertainment Arts, and especially the funding support of uh, the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we've organized this event primarily on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, the Squamish, the Sailbatooth, and the Musqueam nations. And now it is my great joy, honor, pleasure to introduce uh, to you um, someone that I have met entirely through VR. And um, I, th I think for me, like when I think of like, what's been the benefit of all this? Well, it was getting to meet uh, this, this awesome person, um, Casey Coison. Casey is uh, an installation and sound artist, and he's gonna speak to us about his process of learning to sculpt in VR and how he has integrated uh, digital tools into his practice. So uh, Casey, take it away, my friend, and let's give him a round of applause. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Masi Cho. Um, yeah, this is, this is great uh, to be able to do a talk somewhat in person. This is my first virtual reality um, artist talk. Um, and I'd be lying if I said the nervousness still wasn't coming through, but it kind of is. So um, yeah, it's a great opportunity and um, it's, it's been great getting to know Alex and, uh, and Aiden and, and Clayton and the other organizers of this event because I feel it's very, um, a very forward moving sort of way to still be enveloped uh, in the arts and theater world. So my name is Casey Koizen. I'm a Tlicho Dene interdisciplinary artist from Yellowknife Northwest Territories. I'm currently living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I'm navigating my way through a Master of Fine Arts degree um, at the University of uh, Manitoba, um, which is weird, you know, just as is um, everything these days. But um, I'm going to take you through some of my my earlier work, kind of like a, a brief history of of all of my um, artwork leading up until now, and kind of the 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 segue into VR from my installation work. Um, so this is a piece called um, um, audio, it's an audio map basically of the Kamloops um, area where I did my uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts at Thompson Rivers University. Um, and what is happening here, it's an amalgamation of found um, objects and earth materials that have microphones and speakers built into the installation itself um, behind the um, big sort of piece there in the left of center. Behind that is a bunch of effect pedals like a distortion, a delay, and a preamp that sends the input from the mics to the speakers so that people have a sort of interaction with the uh, with the, the installation sculpture itself. Um, you'll see in the bottom left hand corner there it's plugged into the wall which, which kind of powers everything. Um, this was the first time that I I created a installation with earth materials indoors. So it was the first time that I realized um, that that scent and smell was starting to become a part of my artwork because you can actually smell the materials when you're when you're in the space. Um, this is my pride and joy and the dragon that I've been chasing um, ever since I created it. Um, it's called the Mode of Ascension, and it was my uh, fourth year. Um, Bachelor of Fine Arts work. Um, this is a log that um, is about eight feet high by two and a half feet um, in circumference diameter and it's hollowed out uh, three quarters of the way through. And how I acquired this log was that um, there was a pine beetle infestation which happened within um, the southern interior of BC and half of the um, half of the trees on uh, campus were cut down. Uh, Alex, are you megaphoned right now? I'm getting, I'm getting feedback. Check. 
check, check. That fixed it, awesome. Um, so yeah, pine beetle infestation rolled through and half the trees on campus were cut down and um, this piece was just brought to the sculpture studio. Um, and I assumed it was someone, I asked around, it was no one, so took the liberty of, of taking it and creating something of it. So um, began the process of hollowing it out. It took quite a long, long time and I almost broke my wrists in the process because of the reciprocator saw and um, drill and crowbar that I was using to, to do it. Um, and I was acquiring earth materials from all over Kamloops in order to create this like upside down nest kind of, uh, kind of feel. Um, and the audio which is uh, present within this installation is meant to reflect the harmony and the chaos of the universe. Um, we have a, can I play it from there? Nice, oops, that's uh, way back. Uh, let's go with preview it. Okay, not sure how loud the audio is on this, but um, it gives you an idea as to more of the feeling of it. All of the installations that I do have uh, walkthrough videos. So <clears throat> the main inspiration for this installation is straight out of the movie Alien, where Ripley and the child uh, come across the room that's housing the Xenomorph Queen. And it's kind of asserting its dominance, taking over the space and making it its own. Um, so that's always been a very inspirational movie to me. And I wanted to make something like that. So. Um, that is that is basically where the root of the inspiration came for uh, came from for this uh, installation in particular. Um, the dimensions are 50 feet long by 25 feet wide, and I created a, a 15 foot makeshift ceiling out of aircraft cable and um, and earth materials there. So the work that I'm working on right now within my my MFA is basically in uh, the second iteration of this project where instead of one big log, I'm going to have uh, at least five that are, um, that will kind of pick up people's proximity to the logs and they'll resonate their own sort of soundtrack and visuals. Um, and that's currently a work in progress that um, will hopefully be completed by May of uh, 2021, which is hopefully when we'll have our grad but due to COVID, some things have been kind of pushed already and, and stretched back. So we'll see what happens, but we're kind of just going with the flow there. Uh, so that's a little tidbit of that. Um, okay, in 2017, I was asked to take part in the Insurgents Resurgence um, exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, which at the time was the biggest um, uh, exhibit hosting Indigenous artists in Canada. It took up uh, about 10,000 square feet of the gallery, um, pretty much all of the third floor and uh, parts of the, the first and second floor as well. Um, and for this installation, I harvested a bunch of driftwood from the Red River and the Assiniboine Rivers uh, that flow through Winnipeg. And this installation was, uh, it's called Gone But Not Forgotten. And it is meant to pay tribute and to celebrate the lives of people that have been found within those rivers and to address the ongoing MIWG um, crisis within, within Canada. Um, and it was, it was an honor to, to take part in this massive um, exhibit uh, alongside people that I've idolized since my like first and second year of, of my, my BFA. And it was it was just an amazing experience and um, I couldn't be happier with the result and that sort of thing. When the exhibition was coming down, there was a, a tour that was given to elders and chiefs from throughout the Manitoba area. And one of the chiefs um, requested that when the installation be taken down, that the wood um, could be used to burn in ceremony. And they asked me if that was okay. And I, I thought like, that's the perfect way for these materials to return to the earth. So um, that was that was definitely an honor um, to, to have um, and for the materials to go back to the earth because when I don't fabricate the materials with any sort of paint or any sort of chemicals, then they return to the earth in some way. Um, and I think this would be a good time to go to the next video, play. Next. 
Okay, this is a piece called uh, Residential Values, and I created this in 2016, I believe. Um, and this, I call it a performance painting. Um, and it's me taking about 300 to 400 shots of painted pucks onto a canvas that cycle between black, white, and red, black, white, and red. Um, and it's my, my favorite color scheme, but it's also um, a very violent color scheme. Um, but in addition to that, it's a color scheme that's, that's present in many indigenous cultures, not only in Canada, but throughout the world. And this piece is to address um, at the at the heart of it racism in sport, but also um, my father's experience within residential school and playing hockey there, as well as my experience um, as an aspiring hockey player in in southern Alberta, where I faced a lot of racism. It was like the first time that I'd ever experienced it, um, having moved moved from Whitehorse down to uh, down to Lethbridge. Um, so it's to address um, the effects of residential school, uh, the intergenerational effects of residential school within Canada, um, and also that correlation between um, racism and sport and uh, fight, for, fight for equal rights for, for everyone. Um, so all of these videos that I'm playing are um, hosted on my YouTube channel. If you'd like to take the time to go through them at your leisure, um, you're more than welcome to. And, okay, um, I'm just gonna hint on a little bit of, of graphic design. Um, graphic design is something that kind of started my digital journey and arts journey. Um, so I've, I've done work for numerous clients. Uh, this is one of the ones I'm most proud of, which is a, um, an advertisement that I did, a, a segment of an ad advertisement that I did for the city of Yellowknife where I created this uh, vectorized CP in uh, Adobe Illustrator and incorporated the text and the version and that sort of thing. Um, I had the honor of working on a video game. It was the first video game that I that I helped it out with called Thunderbird Strike. Um, the lead creator was uh, Elizabeth Pensier, and um, she asked me to do the um, the music and the sound effects and also the narration for the video game. And ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to do like voices for cartoons and stuff like that. So. It was an opportunity for me to do some voice acting. Um, so I went with this kind of like uh, wrestler kind of indigenous kind of angle on things and came up with the voice for Thunderbird Strike. So I was to create a bunch of different assets for that. And um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to work on. And it was about two years of development, um, very limited budget. Uh, but it was it was more so the concept of the thing because the video game is about a legendary Thunderbird who is basically destroying the oil and gas industry with their lightning eyes and ripping out pipeline from the ground with their claws and that sort of thing. So as soon as she pitched the idea to me, it was like, I'm totally in. I don't care what I get paid, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was submitted to the Imaginative uh, Film and Media Arts Festival in 2017, and um, it, it won best digital media of the of that year um which was an amazing opportunity um however two weeks later there was a article that was released by fox news um basically labeling us as eco-terrorists and that was a whole thing um which was i don't know it was it was very interesting there was a lot of paranoia coming from me as well it's like am i going to be blacklisted from flights like can i not fly anywhere blah 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 um, and I, I really uh, sympathize with Elizabeth because she, uh, being the natural, being the lead, she naturally took a lot of the, the primary heat uh, from all of that, from big oil and all that sort of thing. Um, but regardless, I am very proud of my, my work on this game, and um, I'd really like to have the opportunity to do it again. Um, okay, so... Before I get into some of the VR stuff, I'll um, play the rest of these videos. Let's see what we have. Okay, so um, I'm also a, a audio artist and uh, musician. Um, one of my aliases for um, more of my 
harder kind of sounding electronic work is Naga. And with this um, music video, which I created myself, um, I collaborated with Tanya Snow, who is a uh, uh, Inuit throat singer from Yellowknife. Um, this work was shown at the 2018 um, Imaginative Festival, I believe. Um, it was a lot of fun to work on not only this song, but, but the video as well. Um, and Tanya allowed me to experiment with her voice and her throat singing a little bit. So there's some instances within the, the song and composition where I'm doing a bunch of octaves and kind of crazy cuts and that sort of thing. Um, and utilizing some, some stock footage of uh, nature and animals and that sort of thing to, to bring the whole concept together. Um, I haven't really played much music or live music from 20, or February 2019 to February 2020, just so that I could focus on my uh, artwork. Um, so this was the last uh, music video that I made, but in the future when I release my full um, LP, um, there'll be more videos and compositions that kind of come out of that. Um, oh. um, I have a free EP as Naga to download um, off of Bandcamp, um, and that's available um, within or accessible it's within my so um, website. Done, um, there's a link for that at the end there. So Why, what, do we what everyone is yeah. here for, I assume, is to uh, um, hear about some of the VR stuff. So I will be completely honest. The main so, reason why I got into VR was because of the video game Superhot. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever played Superhot before. Oh, people. Awesome. Right on. Okay, so, yeah, that was the whole reason why I, I got into um, VR in the first place. And um, so I played about 100 to 200 hours of Superhot, and the person, um, or the organization, Western Arctic Moving Pictures, who lent me the VR headset and the gaming laptop at the time, they wanted to push me to do more. So they influenced me to start working with Tilt Brush, and I was kind of surprised as to how quickly I picked it up. Um, because within my journey as an artist, uh, before going to do my BFA at Thompson Rivers University, I really wanted to be able to draw and paint really well, but I just, I was, I'm not good at it. Like, it was, it was something that I really pushed for, but I had to accept that it wasn't my strong point. However, when I started to paint and draw in Tilt Brush, something just clicked, and I knew that it was all about that Z axis to be able to look around the strokes and the brushes that you're making and to really render something that um, you can get a better idea for shape and form and that sort of thing. Um, so this idea came from a actual installation idea that I wanted to do where I would put a whole uh, bunch of spruce boughs that uh, cover an entire city intersection um, in Yellowknife. And I was thinking about this, it was going to be a guerrilla installation, that sort of thing. But the more I thought about it, um, I realized that it could possibly be an installation that could, um, like, I could get charged for it. Like, you know, I started thinking, like, if someone was driving across this and it messes with their vehicle, I could maybe be charged with tampering with a motor vehicle or something like that. So I just decided to do it in VR and um, took it one step further and created uh, a TP um, within an intersection, kind of like this, this reclamation sort of uh, idea and project um, as well. Um, and this is a piece that I created called Raven Gods. And um, when I started in, in VR, I automatically started to be inspired by and create artworks that were about the legends of um, not only indigeneity as a whole, but the legends of the Northwest Territories. Um, and to us, ravens in, in Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories are very sacred animals. So um, I was going for this like council of shadowy figures uh, kind of thing. Um, inspired by Clone High. I don't know if any of you have seen that cartoon, but that was one of the inspirations that came from this. And they're kind of just like watching over us and um, kind of just making sure that we respect the land and each other and that sort of thing. Um, and it was one of the first pieces that I did where I really pushed that scale element of, of virtual reality because 
in Yellowknife, there's not a lot of spaces that you could rent to actually do physical large scale work. So one of the things that was really attractive to me about VR is that you can create something gigantic within a six foot space in your home. Um, so as a large scale artist, um, I really enjoyed that sort of process. So this was kind of the um, idea I had to, to really push that for myself. Um, and in continuing with the um, aesthetic of making northern animals and whatnot, uh, this piece actually came from a dream that I had uh, while I was spending the night at my mom's cabin, which is about 30 to 40 minutes outside of Yellowknife. I had this dream that uh, a pack of five wolves appeared um, around my mom's cabin. Like I woke up, I was still in my dream, but I woke up and I heard this howling. So I went out to her a uh, barbecue pit, basically fire pit on the edge of her uh, land where you could see all the way across the lake. And across the lake, um, there were these five wolves kind of standing there and the one in the middle, their back was on fire. And from this, this vast distance, I could feel that heat somehow and I could see their eyes. And when I had that kind of connection with them, they all kind of ran um, over to kind of like the north side of the lake. Um, and then when I woke up, my mom asked me if I'd heard any wolves. And I, I was like, well, I had a dream about some wolves. And, and she said that there was a pack of wolves that appeared um, around the cabin last night. And the, the cabin across the road from my mom's cabin, they just had a litter of, of puppies um, a couple days previously. So unfortunately, the wolves killed the mother, the father, and two of the puppies, um, and there was two puppies remaining, and my mom adopted one of the puppies um, as her own. So it was a very serendipitous kind of uh, surreal experience to have that, but I also felt obligated to kind of create something that would um, be there as like a, a memory um, for, for, I guess, that instance. Um, and one of the legends of the Northwest Territories is the giant beavers that used to roam the north and occupy the lakes. Um, and legend has it that, that these giant beavers would kill people who are trying to cross the, the lakes um, in their, their birch bark canoes. Um, so I want to make something that was a, a, an intro to kind of that idea. Um, I know this beaver looks really happy and that sort of thing, but in the future that'll change because we want to implement it into this VR experience that we're creating called uh, Wanaze Keofike Sea Visions, which is like a virtual reality 360 experience of all of the, um, the legends of the Northwest Territories. Um, we have uh, more so in the southern sort of areas of the NWT, we have a lot of bison. Um, who occupy a lot of the woods, but also the roads. Um, and sometimes they just won't move. Like if you're driving, there's six or seven bison on the road and there's like, no, no, you go when we say you go, you know? So I um, want to kind of create something like that as well. Um, and oh, I'm getting a bit of feedback again. Check, check. Okay, I'll just go on. Um, okay. So this is implemented into our, actually, uh, I'm, that might be Alex. Could you, oh, there we go, Never mind. Um, so this is implemented into our experience as well as, the, we call it the gatekeeper, um, this bison, and it's kind of an introduction to the experience itself. Um, maybe. Okay, yeah, right on. Um, so this work is called Migration 2491. Um, and these are a bunch of caribou. And what this work is all about is um, kind of a look into the future, uh, because as is right now, that, that occupy the Northwest Territories. And um, the concept behind this is that in the year 2491, which is um, a thousand years um, after the North America, uh, North America was colonized, that 
in the future up in the Northwest Territories that there's going to be so many diamond mines within the the land and structures up there that the caribou won't be able to migrate properly to their breeding grounds because they're already having a really hard time. Their their migration patterns are getting disrupted and it's always fluctuating every year. So my thought is that in the year 2491, one way that the caribou can migrate is by way of a giant portal um, so that they can migrate safely, they can go to their breeding grounds and feeding grounds and come back and everyone's happy. And it's sort of an instance to like save the caribou. Um, next. Oh, I'll save that one for later. Uh, actually, no, I'll save that one right now because I'm almost done. Okay, so this was my first uh, VR commission that I created, um, and it's called With the Ancestors. This was created for the Urban Society of Aboriginal Youth. That's their logo there on the back of the, um, the shawl and the regalia. And it's two fancy dancers, an, an adult and a youth, and this really uh, communicates like the empowerment of women and girls, but also the transference of knowledge and technique um, by way of dancing. Um, so I wanted to make it a, a, a beautiful piece and something that really um, honored um, the people in Alberta. Um, the regalia is inspired by Blackfoot designs um, and with the concept of you're dancing with the ancestors. So an ancestor, ancestor is up in the, uh, the sky kind of watching over them and watching over the powwow. Um, the arbor is inspired by the Kamloopa uh, powwow grounds in Kamloops, BC. Um, yeah, so that is uh, a kind of general idea as to where I've been, where I'm coming from, and where I'm currently at, and where I plan to go in the future. A lot of these VR creations are kind of like sketches that will hopefully develop into something bigger, um, other collaborative ideas, and that sort of thing. Um, if you want to follow me on any sort of uh, social media, these are all my links. Um, I honestly am not on Twitter, like, at all. I, I find it, this is just me, but I find it to be a very toxic kind of platform. <laughs> so I generally just kind of stay away from it. But I'm mostly avidly on, on Instagram and Facebook, and those are my websites. Um, I show a lot of works in progress because I really enjoy seeing other people's works in progress um, and how a project kind of comes from conceptual conceptualization to fruition. Um, so I really like to put that out there as well. Um, so yeah, thank you, Masi Cho. I appreciate everyone coming out and all the hearts and claps and that sort of thing. <laughs> I gotta take a picture of that, it was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. That's amazing. Thank you, Casey. Uh, that was that was awesome. Do, do you want to take a question or two, or? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any any questions for Casey? Let's see if I can monitor. Um, oh, I'm gonna allow hand raises. It's it's tricky because <laughs> the white. The, the snow makes it so that it's hard to see this, but if you kind of like tilt your gaze up to the sky a bit, you'll be able to see, you can raise your hand um, in, in the bottom right hand uh, corner. Oh, okay, we have a question. Uh, we have a question from Raven. Raven, I'm gonna put you on air. Okay, Raven, go ahead. Uh, hey, um, I wanted to, uh, hear about how uh, you decided where the four sacred directions would be in the space. <laughs> in in this space here in Masha World. Yeah, I saw your tobacco ties and wanted to ask you about your process of deciding within a, a digital virtual space what the four directions would be. Um. Yeah. So. Um, that was kind of one of the original ideas for, for this world and this project um, and how to kind of tie it all together um, was to create these tobacco ties um, in, uh, I utilized Blender to make them with, with uh, 
physics and and uh, collision and that sort of thing, um, and allocating the medicine wheel concept of of that. Um, so the red, white, black, and yellow, um, and then distributing them uh, distributing them in the the world itself. Um, so I basically made the models and and handed it over to Alex with the kind of general kind of concept. I don't know exactly how specific they are in terms of like where north, uh, south, west, and east is because I honestly don't know within this within this world. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it if it really matters too much, but uh, that's sort of how that idea uh, came about. Awesome. Any other questions? That was a good one. Okay. All right. Is there another one? I think, I think that's everyone. Okay. All right. Uh, so <laughs> people have found the fireworks. I, I, I do want to um, maybe let's give her another round of applause for Casey. And then I think I will, uh, I, I, I just have a few things I'd like to say just to thank a few people, but uh, round of applause for Casey. Casey, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. And it was so great to hear about your journey with this, uh, this all these cool new tools. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure. So um, yes, and feel free to shoot off some fireworks <laughs> as I do this. Uh, yeah, grab, grab a firework, fire them off. This is, this is the end of PXR 2020. Um, I want to thank our, our core team, uh, Ian and Justine Garrett from Toaster Lab, uh, Jesse uh, and Clayton from Electric Company, uh, Amanda Baker, Kristen, Chloe, David, Liam, and Aiden on the single thread side. Uh, this has been a really long journey. We've been working at this for uh, <laughs> some of us more than uh, six months, so it's been a long, long haul. Um, I want to thank our partners, starting with Electric Company, uh, who this came out of an introduction uh, from Jiv Parasram at Rumble, who, who recommended that Clayton and I meet up. And uh, Clayton just like was willing to meet with me, which I think is so important that, um, I don't know, people who are more established and leaders uh, take that time to do that. And, and he, Clayton has really believed in this project from day one and trusted Single Thread with a lot. Um, and we've worked really hard to try to live up to the trust that Electric has put in to us. Um, I want to thank Toaster Lab uh, for their help with outreach, with streaming, with planning. I want to thank Cohort for contributing uh, their staff, their time to uh, helping us with workshops. I want to thank Outside the March, Vancouver VR, CEA, and The Pulch for their support and engagement. I want to thank our steering committee uh, who have helped guide this event and have been fantastic at advising our decision making. Uh, Clayton, Ian, Melissa, Liam, Beth, Milton, Griffin, and Evo, thank you guys for, for guiding us on this journey. Um, I want to single out Beth Cates, who has been an absolutely incredible collaborator on this project and has offered me so much great advice. And uh, I know that many of you are here through your connection to Beth, and that really speaks to the work that she has done to build up this, uh, this XR community. Thank you to our volunteers in purple. Uh, for your help getting us oriented in the space. We appreciate all the time that you've, uh, you've given to us. And finally, uh, this entire thing would not have been possible without the Canada Council Digital Strategy Fund. So thank you, Canada Council, for supporting our knowledge growth and exploration of the XR medium, and also your willingness to support our pivot to virtual reality. Uh, when I phoned you up and I was like, uh, can we do this? And, and you were like, yeah, absolutely. And I hope... Uh, you're, you're happy with the outcome. So uh, we're going to send out a feedback survey to all of you, uh, in which we hope you'll take the time to fill that out as we uh, figure out how to do this better uh, next time around. We would like to do this again next year, and we are actively planning uh, PXR 2021. And if you are interested in collaborating with us next year, please let us know. Please come and find myself. Liam or Clayton, and uh, let's talk about how we can do this again next year. All right, uh, I have nothing else to say. Let's fire off some fireworks and uh, have a good time. Thank you all so much.
for taking the time to do this. It's been amazing.